This program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the Eau Claire Area School Board. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.5. Tonight, um, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Brian Moi. Uh, Brian, would you kindly uh, get to the microphone uh, over there so we can hear you? Uh, Brian is a fifth grader at Locust Lane. Uh, Principal Laura Sch uh, Schlichting said that Brian is a very good citizen at Locust Lane. Uh, he's kind and respectful and he's a wonderful role model for his classmates and we wanted to uh, honor you, Brian. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Tonight's meeting will be broadcast on Charter Channel 994, WRFB 101.9 FM, and online at valleymediaworks.org. And ECASD.us. Uh, are we in compliance with the open meeting law notifications? Yes. Thank you. Uh, let's do a roll call to verify form. Commissioner Harder? Here. Commissioner Klinkhammer? Commissioner Lukenbell? Commissioner Torres? Here. Commissioner Vu? Here. Commissioner Nordeen? Here. Commissioner Bika. Here. We have forum. Um, thank you very much. The public forum, um, each citizen will be allowed to up to four minutes to address the board, providing that he or she has additional or new information that has not been previously shared at the meeting. The school board will not hear personal complaints of school personnel nor any person connected with the school system in a public forum. Uh, we have four speakers uh, signed up for tonight, and the first one is Mr. Carlson, Doug Carlson. Please say your name and your address. Thank you. Uh, with the process that was used, and uh, so I just have a story I want to tell you, a hypothetical story. Uh, once upon a time, there was a school district that owned an elementary school, and uh, it had been closed for 10 years, and it was thought to be surplus property. Uh, the board was approached by an unsolicited, by uh, someone with unsolicited offer to, to purchase it. Uh, the, bold, the board told the prospective buyers that they appreciated their interest in the property uh, and they'd like to continue an open dialogue with them, but uh, they are going to decided that they were going to use possibly two different public approaches to sell the property. Uh, the first one is a process that's used commonly here. The town of Brunswick has used it when we were approached to buy property. The county uses that process, and it is a simple process of publicly noticing uh, the property being for sale and accepting bids, closed seal bids, and opening the bids and uh, choosing what to do from that point forward. The second process that's used in the area is the one that the city uses. In the city, let's say they have a block that they want to have developed. You all know that what they do is they open it up for development proposals. And so that's a, a, a very open process. They accept pro uh, development proposals that meet the goals and they move forward. So uh, both processes do give the, a fair opportunity to all the public and the developers to come forward. And that's open and transparent. And they would certainly uh, welcome proposals from the people that had approached them initially. It would be open to all. Uh, and what the board decided to do was use the city development process. Now remember, this is a story that I'm telling you. 
And uh, what they did decide to do is put a date certain end on the process, call it six months and uh, of, ex of exploration, which coincided, by the way, with the city's plan to annex the property. It takes months to get that annexation completed, as you know. Uh, so the board, what the board did was they went out to the town of Brunswick and met with the town of Brunswick people, uh, the city, uh, excuse me, the town of Brunswick organization and the city and decided to partner with them to explore the development process that they could develop that 30 acres out there. And uh, they laid out all the steps to get to, get to these multiple development proposal, uh, proposals that they'd like to see. The town of Brunswick held community meetings very open process, looking for ideas. What would the town of Brunswick like to have in that in that community, you know, in that area? Remembering, you all know that there is a lot of emotion associated with that property. It taught children out there for many years. Residents went there, grandchildren went there, so uh, the involvement of the community was important. Uh, after holding those meetings, uh, the, the, this, the community expressed so many ideas. Uh, they end up they ended up saying they would like to see a multi-use uh, uh, for that property. It's a large building. Think of all the different uses that, that that property could have. A variety of businesses could be used there. It's a very unique property. It's uh, got over a quarter mile of frontage on Highway 37. It's only a mile outside of town. Uh, there's about 15,000 vehicles that go by there every day. You can imagine the business opportunities uh, that would go on there. You know, people would say things like, well, if with multi-uses, you could put a, a daycare in one end. You could put a coffee shop in there. You could even have a little red microbrewery out there. Uh, lots of opportunities. So um, there was also the possibility that the town could decide to put their town hall there. There was possibility that the, the fire department, which is cramped in the space that they currently have. Yes. In Excuse me, Mr. Brunswick. Carlson, your time is up. Could you wrap up the story? Very good. So the point of the story is that the process like that would have been very open and transparent and would find the highest and best use for the property. It's not clear that that was done. So the question, the final question was, where was the board's uh, collaborative and visionary spirit uh, I feel that the board's thinking was very narrow, short-sighted, and not inclusive and transparent. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Susan Smith. Good evening. I was here before also talking about Little Red, and I'm here again tonight about <clears throat> that. Um, my concern with the selling of the Little Red property has to do with um, the crowding at the, the overcrowding at the Southside schools. And um, this overcrowding has been an issue that's been watched for decades. I've, I've been in this district for more than any of you, and I've heard that term over and over again. We're going to watch and see what happens, but nothing ever seems to come of it. Um, what I'm hoping is, I'm hoping that this district does have a long-term plan to solve that issue. And possibly Little Red, the selling of Little Red has something to do with that. But so far, I haven't seen any long-term plans. Um, in some of the minutes from the board's demographic trends and facility planning committee, I see that adding a fourth section to some of the Southside schools has been discussed. Um, this past May 16th meeting, the comment was made in the minutes, um, if budgets continue, we need to be doing four sections as a minimum. That never came up when I heard about talking about selling Little Red, that they were, you know, that you were considering adding four sections to some of those buildings. Um, the educational impact of such at large elementary schools aside, I assume that a cost-benefit analysis has been done comparing adding classrooms, bathrooms, cafeteria space, equipment, et cetera, to possibly three schools was compared to just adding on to Little Red, which was designed in 1998 for such an expansion. Um, releasing such a study which shows the district long-term plans and the cost of such would hopefully quiet the discussion that selling Little Red was a knee-jerk band-aid and a drop in the bucket for solving the, dis the district's budget issues while ignoring these students sitting in these overcrowded schools. Um, last year, according to the Eau Claire School District data, five elementary schools were at 90% capacity, four of which were on the south side. You know, and many of those classrooms have students over the number recommended by many educational institutions such as National Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, they're too crowded. Uh, the 98 referendum put more than a million dollars into that Little Red renovation. 
It closed 10 years later, and 10 years after that, it was sold for $620,000. In 2018, the Eau Claire County Land Use Committee ranked Town of Brunswick as the fastest growing area in, in the school district, only behind the Town of Union, and Union was growing due to business growth. Brunswick was growing due to family home building. There's a difference there, obviously. Um, we know parents and students and staff, <clears throat> excuse me, feel more connected in a neighborhood school, but I feel this district has gone in the opposite direction. Many past school closure decisions, while most were not made by the current board members, have left many people wondering about long-term plans. We need to feel these closures are well-planned and in the best interest of all students, which includes public input in those decisions. I understand issues with the school funding formula, as well as funding that's being siphoned off from public schools by the, school, by the state voucher program. And I would encourage this board to please lobby your legislators to remedy both of those things. We need to fix the school funding formula and be more transparent about what vouchers are doing to public schools. But I'm asking that this board prove to taxpayers of this district that selling Little Red was a cost-saving measure in the long term with future plans for Southside expansion and that there is a report somewhere that proves as such or I fear that any future referendum effort is futile. I look forward to seeing that report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. The next speaker is uh, Erica Christensen. I have to admit I feel a little unprepared. I decided to come kind of at the last minute and um, I, to be honest, don't know if this has been a topic that's been discussed recently um, at the board, but it has become quite urgent to me and I guess to uh, ad additional parents, but um, in the past week at school, um, there have been such a lack of substitute teachers that our classrooms have gone without staffing and students have been shifted to different areas of the school to make sure that they are covered. And so I would just like to take a quick second to speak to the board in a way that references what can we do about the the shortage, I guess, and how can we apply our resources to better equip our staff, I guess, with schools and our schools with teachers that will take care of our children. Um, and it has, like I said, of the past, in the past week, my son has had three different teachers and one day with no teacher and he was divided up into different, his class was divided up. And that's not anything that should ever really be a concern as where is my kid today and additionally um, when I've made efforts to contact staff regarding what's going on and the communication regarding I have not ever received communication back so that's my concern thank you thank you very much the next speaker is Karen Voss Good evening, and is this on? Okay, and thank you for um, listening to what I have to say. Um, I'm actually here to comment on what I have learned since a month ago um, when I was here because I was um, aware only at the very last minute that Little Red was being sold. Um, I actually made open records requests to the school board and to the city council and I went back and read uh, minutes from city council meetings and school board meetings for the last two years. And what I found, and also the city, count, the city responded to my open records request and provided quite a bit of information. And that information allowed me to figure out that um, the school district approached the city over a year ago about gaining um, title to the property at Little Red and spent some time back and forth with the city trying to gain that title. And the city, meanwhile, was working toward annexing 
um, the property to the city. And ultimately, uh, the, as we know, the annexation occurred in June, early June, and then the um, title transfer happened a couple weeks after that. So none of that appeared in, it was in the city council minutes, but it never appeared in the school board minutes, which, which bothers me that those big decisions just weren't part of a public record. And um, so I actually I found out about 10 days after I made my open records request that the school board's attorney, um, Mr. Strutz, uh, said that the two transactions are not completed until October 15th and that the district will not treat them as a done deal. And the argument is that the public interest in holding the records outweighs the interest in disclosing the records because the school district received an offer to buy and because they didn't have an asking price advertised, there was an aspect of competition built into the process. Now, I don't really get that, but that's, that was what I was told. And that as long as um, there are competitive reasons for withholding information regarding the sale, that that information would not be released until October 15th. So I don't know. I really have no information on over this past year what the school district steps have been in looking at Little Red. All I know is that me as a citizen knew nothing about it until September 5th or 6th, something like that. Um, so I, I think the other thing that bothers me about the response I received is that that argument was used to withhold all the records related to the sale of Little Red, including an appraisal which the school district purchased, I'm sure, with our, our taxes. I mean, I don't understand why those things um, aren't publicly available when we know what the cost or what the sale price is, we know what the appraisal price is, that's been public. Why has nothing else been made available um, to me as a result of my public records request? I don't understand that. And then there was a follow-up letter in which uh, Attorney Strutz said that uh, to let me know that both of the offers to purchase that are at issue here contain provisions expressly requiring the buyers to keep the terms of the offer confidential. Why would the school district tell the buyers to keep the terms of the offer, require that they keep the terms confidential? It erodes my confidence in any sense of openness to hear that. Um, certainly your goals and your partnerships with families and community are pretty much the opposite of that. Um, they, they state that the district-wide communication uh, plan should assure that all communications are streamlined and timely and transparent. This doesn't fit with that. Um, and the importance of collaborating with parents and community partners. I think, I think we're lacking that. Um, it feels to me that the district has really blocked public access from this process. And my trust really that, that the school district is making decisions in the best interest of the students and families um, has certainly been um, very thoroughly eroded. And I think one thing that concerns me more than anything, and it's one that Sue mentioned and that um, Doug also mentioned, is I, don't, I haven't seen anything that convinces me that there was a careful look at how Little Red might or might not, in a cost-effective way, fit into long-range planning to meet the needs of our students. Thank you, Mrs. Balls. So Your you. time is up. That was for the public forum, part of our session. Uh, now we go to the board and administrative reports. Uh, Dr. Hardebeck, superintendent's report. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, the first thing I would like to do is to review the upcoming events for the school board. On August 8th, there will be a meeting of the Budget Development Committee, which will take place at 1 o'clock, and that will be followed by a LEAP Committee meeting that will take place at 4 p.m. On October 15th, the Eau Claire Virtual School Governance Board will have its annual meeting, and that is at 4.30. Um, and on August, I mean, sorry, October 17th at 4.30 p.m., Demographic Trends and Facilities Planning Team will meet, and then on October 21st, 
policy and governance will meet at 8.30 a.m. and that will be followed that evening by school board meeting. So I am uh, very proud to share tonight that we have three National Merit Scholarship semifinalists from the Eau Claire Area School District. From Memorial High School, we have seniors Alexandra Bindborn, is that the, is that the correct, oh, I didn't want to slide, and um, Ron Kosequin, yes. would you stand up? Um, and from North High School, we have senior Lydia Monk. Is Lydia? Oh, thank you, Lydia. Um, so I think it's important for the board and for the public to know that students who apply for the National Merit Scholarship must have taken the PSAT and be enrolled in high school with a plan to accept admission to a college no later than the fall following high school completion. There are 1.6 million entrants for the scholarship and there are only 16,000 students who are semifinalists. Um, and keep in mind that there are about 14,000 school districts uh, in the United States. It's a huge accomplishment uh, for these three students to be in this group of semifinalists, and it is an individual accomplishment. So we want to recognize you, and we want to congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, this week we received an update from Focus on Energy. In um, 2012, the school district and Focus on Energy um, took on a number of energy saving projects. Um, to date, we have 113 of those energy saving projects in the district. And some of those projects include boiler tune ups, upgrades to LED lights, uh, transitions to high efficiency equipment, um, doing things like turning off the lights. Uh, but the focus on energy recently notified us that the district is saving approximately $500,000 a year by taking on and implementing these changes. And this has saved taxpayers millions of dollars and helped us to maintain our certification as a green business. So this is a team effort. It not only involves buildings and grounds, but it involves all of our employees. And um, it requires a little bit of discipline in terms of implementing these strategies. So I want to thank everyone, but I also uh, wanted the school board to know that we have taken on these energy efficiencies and it is paying off in terms of uh, savings. So the Family Advisory Council held its first meeting on October 1st and they elected officers. Jenna Murphy will serve as the chair, Rob Geske as the vice chair, and Ann Hartman as the secretary. And Brooke Carnes has agreed to serve as a backup secretary if needed. Um, the FAC received a presentation on the status of the Eau Claire Virtual School which opened and is now serving 23 students. There are five seats left in the virtual school and will be available to, for students to transfer into um, during the second semester. Um, a parent uh, representative has joined the Family Advisory Council uh, representing the Eau Claire Virtual School and we're very happy to have them uh, with us. I shared that there are three things that have happened with the school board. Um, we talked about the change in boundaries, um, the updates that will occur to Roosevelt. Um, we also talked about um, some budget information and the fact that numbers are still being finalized. And then we talked about the superintendent search. And I think that the Family Advisory Council is very eager to give input uh, to that search and have requested a time to do so. Um, we had a great opening of schools, and I shared that with the uh, FAC, and uh, it was kind of a pleasure to recognize our staff um, and getting everything ready for the school year. So the next meeting will be November 5th. Um, and that will take place here in the administration building at 7 p.m. And this week 
is Wisconsin School Board Appreciation Week. So the school board members use their positions as elected officials to give um, uh, the citizens uh, representation about decisions that are being made. They devote countless hours to making sure that our schools meet the needs of every child and prepare students for post-secondary success. Um, I think, you know, we probably all agree that they're faced with very tough decisions and um, on behalf of the entire Eau Claire Area School District, I'd like to say thank you to the board members for all they do to serve our students and our community and for all the time that they give to our community. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hardebeck. Um, it is really a privilege to serve in this board. Um, the next point in the agenda is the president's report. So that's my report. I only have two points. Uh, the first one, just to give you an update of um, the superintendent search process. Under the leadership of Dr. Lori Bica, we have been able to um, uh, invite input from each one of the school buildings in our district, and the process is going on. There will be also um, three opportunities for the community at large to provide input uh, in the process. At this point, this early intervention is to help us uh, define the job description and see what are the aspirations and ideas that um, all those involved uh, have about um, our future superintendent. So we are moving forward in that, in that sense. Um, the second point is that um, our state uh, superintendent, uh, uh, Carolyn Stanford Taylor, has proclaimed October to be the Gifted Education Month. Uh, gifted Education helps to identify, instruct, and support all students with intellectual, academic, creative, leadership, and artistic gifts. Uh, in honor of Gifted Education Month, um, I would like, we would like to say thank you to Dr. Kayin Shong, Director of Student Services, and her team of coordinators and teachers who strive to support students in utilizing their gifts and talents beyond the traditional classroom setting. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shong to come um, to the front and receive this uh, proclamation. Uh, by our state superintendent. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you. And that's for the report uh, of the president of the board. The next uh, point in the agenda is student representative report. Uh, Morgan Prem. Hello. Last meeting I talked about Memorial's uh, celebration of homecoming. Uh, so that included a student talent show, pep rally, parade, football game, and the dance, all of which were successful and had great turnout. Uh, recently, this past weekend, we had the Crosstown football game. Um, it's a special event that brings students together from North and Memorial together through some friendly competition. Uh, it's always a good time. Uh, recently, we had two special opportunities for students to participate in. There was the Junior Career Fair, which took place at the Indoor Sports Center. Um, it was an optional field trip for juniors in which they could interact with professionals in various fields, um, explore different career interests, um, and decide which path they'd like to pursue in the future whether that's university or technical college or just going straight into the workforce. Um, the second opportunity was the Nobel Conference. Uh, 10 students from North and 10 students from Memorial were able to attend this, um, the 55th Annual Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. Uh, during their three-day trip, they were able to hear presentations from Nobel Prize winners and interact with other youth from across the country who are interested in the sciences. Finally, our last event that occurred in the past two weeks was the blood drive. Um, during this blood drive, we were able to collect 82 units of blood. Uh, blood drive participants, however, are limited those 
to those who are 16 years or older and not participating in a sport. Currently, we have two blood drives, one that takes place in the fall and one that takes place in the spring. Um, so we're looking to possibly start a blood drive for the winter, just so that students who are participating in sports, both in the fall and the spring, are able to participate in a blood drive during the year. Um, we have actually had Marshfield Clinic reach out to Memorial recently about partnering for a blood drive. Um, so we're looking to possibly partner with them to start a winter blood drive um, and have that run by Memorial's other volunteer organization, Key Club. And that is all for my report. Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. Uh, Johnny Shong is not able to be with us tonight, but he sent his report, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, North High School soccer team recently went against Menominee and Rice Lake. North was able to beat Menominee and become victorious. This week's fixtures are North versus Memorial tomorrow at 4.30 at North High School and North versus Chippewa at Chippewa High School at 7 under the lights. John invites all the board members and all present to attend and enjoy the two exciting soccer games. Uh, North High School's varsity football team went against Memorial on Friday last week at Carson Park Football Stadium. The final score in the game was 0-35 to, to 35 with Memorial taking the win. Today was the re registration of North High School's Rowdy Ruff Tournament. Rowdy Ruff is a volleyball tourney held at uh, North. Johnny invites finally all to attend the Memorial North Volleyball game on October the 10th at 7 p.m. in the Memorial High high school gym. The two teams are raising funds for the local chapter of the American Cancer Society and there will be raffles from Blue Ox Music Festival, Country Rock Fest, Carlson Chiropractic, Silver Springs Food, Pepsi, Shields, Marquardt Toyota, Country Jam, Brew Pub, Pizza, Chippewa Valley Sporting Goods and Coin Collection Buckets. That was Johnny's report. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next point in the agenda is school board committee reports. Um, budget? Thank you. Good evening. Yeah, we, the budget committee did meet on uh, September 24th, and we discussed the budget committee's work timeline on both a, a one-year, a, a two-year, and a five-year sort of time frame got a working list of items uh, that include potential cost saving measures, notions of potential revenue ideas, including referendum. We talked through a few of those ideas and um, are, are, we'll be continuing that discussion. Uh, actually, we have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lurkin Hammer is not in for the report, but Kim, do you have? The LEAP committee meets tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, policy and governance met this morning, and we have uh, approved a draft for the full board consideration in regards to um, making official and more formal all the green initiatives that we have had in the uh, latest uh, few years. So hopefully that will give us... Uh, will continue to give us a sense of direction towards um, becoming more independent in uh, energy use and also to adopt um, a no waste uh, policies in all our buildings. Am I missing someone in that report? Demo and trends? No, okay, good. Thank you. Um, our next point in the agenda is the legislative update. Uh, update. Uh, Dr. Nordin. Uh, the Wisconsin Senate will meet tomorrow. It's only uh, floor session of October. That will begin at 11 a.m. There are several bills pertaining to education on the agenda. They're mostly technical in nature, but they include Senate Bill 160 relating to the method of providing notice of a special meeting of the school board. Senate Bill 230 relating to teacher preparatory programs and granting rulemaking authority. Assembly Bill 51 relating to the minority teacher loan program. Assembly Bill 53 relating to pupil records. Assembly Bill 54 relating to fire, tornado, and school safety drills. And Assembly Bill 195 related to teacher licensure based on reciprocity. Um, just as a little background, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards is monitoring Assembly Bill 
five one and supports the others. Uh, contact your state senator uh, quickly if you'd like to have your voice heard on these bills. Thank you very much. The next point in the agenda is a consent resolution agenda. Uh, the board will consider approval of the consent resolution agenda items. Um, for the consent agenda, the board has been furnished with background material on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. This will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it will be pulled out of the consent agenda and voted on separately. The items are 7.2 minutes of September 23rd, 2019, 7.3 minutes of closed session September 23rd, 2019, 7.4 minutes of work session September 25th, 2019, 7.5, 2018-19 budget adjustment, 7.6, Human Resources Employment Report, 7.7 .7 Revisions to Policy 751.5 Student Transportation in Private Vehicles, and 7.8 Proposed Policy 675 Construction Contracts. I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the Consent Resolution Agenda. So moved. Thank you. Moved by Second. Mr. Vu. Second by Dr. Nardin. Uh, let's do let's do a roll call for the vote. Commissioner Harder? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Torres? Yes. Commissioner Vu? Yes. Commissioner Nordine? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the motion carries. Our next item in the agenda is um, individually considered resolutions. At this point, we will discuss the Alliance for Substance Abuse Prevention Funding. Uh, this item was presented for our consideration the previous uh, uh, session. Uh, uh, how is the board, how are board members um, thinking about it? Has it been um, considered in the budget? It, it came up through budget, but we really didn't have time to discuss it. Uh, it was uh, it came up rather quickly as something to consider to bring forward to the full board, and I think that we agreed to do that. Uh, uh, it could be bounced back to budget, certainly, if, if any member wanted to suggest that. but. Um, uh, you know, I'm just recalling our, our presentation in the last meeting uh, about the the many benefits of this program and also the costs and the cost sharing model that is being developed. Um, I think there were, as I recall, there were some uh, there was some funding that had not not yet been secured. It's kind of being pieced together, and uh, in the meantime, they're just sort of running under their own uh, out of their own fund balance, I believe, out of mm -hmm. out of the county office and so I think the question before the board just from my perspective to, and to remind everybody from my point of view what what it was about is do we want to contribute to this do we consider the amount to be the right amount to contribute uh, and uh, I don't know if we have the, those slides handy it might be useful to, to look at if we are going to have a discussion about this tonight to, to just review those those numbers again but that um, that's kind of the synopsis as I recall it okay so we don't have a recommendation from budget yet not as of yet no. okay. does anyone have other questions uh, I am going to follow up on a commentary made by dr. Bika last session about the, um, the model uh, in the, the innovative model um, while the list of uh, institutions that have been invited to contri continue contributing is large, um, um, there is not much contribution from uh, private industry 
and and corporations and business community um, in in the region. Uh, so I'm wondering whether we can um, advise the alliance to also open a front there to um, invite more contributions. Uh, since it's prevention, we have a large community, a large business community in our midst that uh, profit with the uh, selling of alcohol, for example. Uh, it will be wonderful if they can contribute to this cause as well. Are there any other questions or commentaries? If not, we'll resend this to the budget committee for a recommendation, and we'll include it in our next in our next session. Thank you. At this time, we will adjourn to committee. Uh, the board committee report. The school board allows public comments after each committee report to ask questions and or request clarification on the topic of discussion. If you have an opposing viewpoint or wish to speak in support of an item, please sign up for the public forum section of the school board meeting at the next regular meeting. You must sign in five minutes before the school board meeting. Um, committee reports. Uh, we will begin with Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation annual report. Thank you for this opportunity. And um, thank you so much for all you do for our community on behalf of the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation Board and the Eau Claire Community Foundation Board. Thank you for your volunteerism and all the extra you do for our community. Thank you. Thank you for announcing it's School Board Recognition Week. That was wonderful. Um, the Wisconsin Department of Public Institution Instruction lists 149 school foundations in the state. So the concept of a school foundation is widely embraced. The foundations are in large cities like Milwaukee, Madison, Appleton, and Oshkosh, as well as in small districts like Spooner, Rhinelander, Marshfield, Altoona, and Chippewa Falls. Some are component funds of the area's community foundation, similar to the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation. The Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation's mission is dedicated to promoting education by fostering supportive relationships with the Eau Claire School District and the community. By raising funds to provide learning opportunities for students, teachers, and staff, and awarding grants for value-added projects. The vision, ensuring the future. Dustin handed out the annual report. The annual report is designed to report to the community the outcomes of the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation, but also to educate others on the different ways they can support the Eau Claire Area School District. There are 14 members from our community that are on the Board of Trustees, and you can see them listed in the report. There are 14 members with a wealth of expertise. On the Executive Committee alone is Chair Dr. Belinda Yun from Mayo Clinic Health System, Vice Chair James McDougall from JAMP, and Treasurer Dustin Weisner, CPA at Wifley, who is with me this evening. When you open up the inside, you'll see that there is different types of funds. Actually, currently, there are 49 funds that are directly affect the needs of the schools. There are 10 endowment funds with the purposes, for example, art in the classroom. And for individual schools in general, which may cover art, music, math, athletics, to students in need to assist with homelessness and hunger. There are seven scholarship funds, six pass-through funds, two donor advised funds that donors have the ability to recommend grants, 20 unrestricted funds, probably some of the most important funds for the individual schools, where grants are recommended by principals for the greatest needs in each school. There are also four foundation funds that are district-wide that donors can utilize 
They are the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation's Fund for Operations. The fund for today, for which covers, helps to cover the overall greatest needs of the district. A fund for tomorrow and the endowed fund for the future. Inside you will find a listing of these funds. Just in 2018 alone, seven new funds were established at the, community, at the Public Schools Foundation. And it was a record year for grants. Over $124,000 in grants helped support our schools. Those grants supported over $48,000 in supplies and other support for students in need. $21,000 in scholarships for students pursuing post-secondary education. And additional funding for 31 field trips and other immersive experiences. Since establishment of the Eau Claire Community Foundation, they have granted to the schools and post-secondary schools for the students' future education, 588 grants totaling over $618,000. In 2019 alone, 108 grants were distributed, that's just this year, for over $133,000. Newly formed, inside, in the cover, you will see the Legacy Society. This is ensuring the future forever for our schools. So far, eight individuals have become charter members, leaving their legacy in their estate plan for learning for the schools. Featured is Charlie and Becky Grossclass. Charlie is the former CEO of Royal Credit Union and past Eau Claire Public School Foundation's board chair. You will find on the back the um, financials on the back cover. The foundation ended 2018 with assets totaling $1,792,000 uh, $288. Through June 2019, that number has increased to over $2 million, actually $2,238,774. The op its operational revenue for 2018 was $65,370 when you look at the two lines. A portion of, these, of this revenue was from support of the Eau Claire Area School District. Your support helps the foundation focus on development by growing assets and increasing grants annually for its sole purpose, the Eau Claire Area School District. The operational expenses for 2018 were six thousand or six sixty-seven thousand two hundred and sixty-four dollars. In 2018, 518 donations were processed through the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation. In 2019, they have already processed over 558 donations, totaling over four hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars. This alone is a tremendous savings financially for the Eau Claire School District. I'd like to take a minute and share with you the financial overview that Dustin's going to hand out. I think you should know just a little bit about what happens with the investments. On this investment overview that you'll see is the um, initiatives that um, is assigned to the investment committee at the Eau Claire Community Foundation. And you will see the investment um, committee chair, Tom Larson, and um, the remainder of expertise we have for our investments. We actually have two diverse, two types of investment portfolios that are available to donors. There's the diversified portfolio, which is a general portfolio, and through several RFPs, we are still with Oracle Wealth Management. And we have established a new socially responsible SRI portfolio that excludes the investments in firearms, in um, alcohol, tobacco, but maybe it um, helps promote more thematic investing, diversity, and um, environment. So that option is now available for donors, another way to increase assets. On the back shows some of the results. But I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what we share with donors and what we do in the community. Along with the financial port on the back, and most important to note, 
is our founding partners for education. Without these individuals, families, and businesses, the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation would not be in existence today. The founding partners know and understand the core value of education foundations. They know that education foundations can be a connector to community services, collaborator with strategic partners, conveyor with courageous conversations, and a conduit by which the community can invest in education. Lastly, I would like to note that for the annual report, um, the photos were provided by Jeff Thompson uh, from the school that works, I think, for the school district. And the layout and design was by Pa Yang, graphic design intern for the Eau Claire Community Foundation. And she is soon to be graduating from the University of Eau Claire. We thank you very much for your trust and confidence in the Eau Claire Public Schools Foundation. Dustin is here with me this evening. If we can help answer any of your questions, we would love to be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, report to both of you. Uh, would just like to express our gratitude for your partnership with us and your uh, leadership in advancing the interests of the, all the students in our community. For that, we are very, very appreciative. Thank you. Uh, now, I'd like to invite uh, any questions from the board members or questions from the community. Hearing none, I will just um, uh, reiterate that uh, it is our interest to continue working with you, of course, and that uh, we are very excited to uh, have planned a work session in the next few weeks to continue fine-tuning the way in which we collaborate together. Thank you very much, and we really appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> the next report is a, a referendum update. Sorry, I have a cold. <laughs> My brain might not be working. <laughs> I'll start over. Um, thanks for letting us be here tonight. Um, I'm here with um, Daryl Peterson, Interim Director of Buildings and Grounds, and Holly Kitchell, um, Facilities Planning Manager um, for the district. And we wanted to talk with you today about um, some of the facility updates from the 2016 referendum. Uh, this is linked to our strategic plan specifically around the partnerships with our families and communities and our goal of collaborating with the parent and community partners on district and school level goals and priorities. Uh, the 2016 referendum focused on two areas, uh, debt service for capital improvement projects and operating needs. Tonight we'd like to share with you an update regarding the progress that we've made um, specifically on some of the deferred capital improvement projects that we had. Um, one of the most important responsibilities that we have as administrators and as a school board is um, solid stewardship of um, our resources. And in many ways, buildings or facilities are one of the biggest assets we have. As an example, Holly reminded me that um, the building that we're sitting in right now is nearly 100 years old, and we have gotten a lot for the money that the district spent at the time the building was constructed. So um, capital improvements are a wise investment for the future. Um, the um, improvement projects that we had were really focused on deferred maintenance and safety and security improvements. Building maintenance and safety and security improvements included projects from roofing and HVAC to paving and ADA compliance. And for the past three summers, our um, buildings and grounds department has invested a tremendous amount of time um, planning and collaborating and working alongside architects and contractors to bring each of those check marks up there that you see 
um, to life. Just as a reminder, there are some projects that if you look here on um, the schools that have stars are the ones that were included in the referendum and then each of the check marks is a project within the referendum um, for that school. There are other projects that you might see or hear such as the culinary projects at our high school this last summer um, or the secure entrance at South. They were not part of the referendum. Those were part of our capital improvements budget or some grant work. So tonight we just want to focus on which were the projects for the 2016 referendum and so with that I'm going to pass it first on to Holly and then she will pass it on to Daryl. Thanks, Holly. Mm -hmm. Good evening. So as you can see up on the screen, uh, we're just going to talk specifically about the projects that we worked on this past summer, the 2019 projects that kind of, for all intents and purposes, rounded out our, our three summers of referendum projects. Uh, the schools that we touched this summer are listed there. We, we touched Memorial, McKinley, Flynn, Locust Lane, Meadowview, Northwood, Sam Davey, and Prairie Ridge. Um, the construction this past summer totaled just over $5 million. Some of the improvements that were made at Memorial, uh, the Arlington Wing got an upgrade with the HVAC system uh, in addition to new energy efficient windows. Uh, we also re-roofed the two-story portion of the building and over the pool area and we did some brick tuck pointing on some of the original portions of the building to keep it weather tight. At McKinley we finished up the new secure entrance and building addition over there. Um, that's been an extended project that has uh, has recently wrapped up. Flynn, uh, one of our newer buildings, it received a secure entrance uh, and an office remodel um, to help facilitate the function of the new secure entrance. At Locust Lane, uh, we were kind of invasive on this building this summer. We did a secure entrance and office remodel. Um, we replaced both of the boilers there. Uh, we did a complete fire alarm upgrade and a couple of the toilet rooms we had to upgrade for ADA compliance. And then we also repaved all the parking lots and the playground there. Meadowview received, received a secure entrance and an office remodel, and also their toilet rooms were upgraded to ADA compliance. Northwoods received a secure entrance, office remodel. Uh, the fire alarm system there was also upgraded. The parking lot and the playground were repaved. And at Sam Davy, we did a secure entrance, office remodel, and we added a receiving area onto the front of the building. Uh, we repaved the parking lot, I'm sorry, the playground, and the <coughs> 1972 portion of the building, which is the one-story portion, uh, that area was re-roofed. And at Prairie Ridge, they received a secure entrance, an office remodel. Uh, the toilet rooms were remodeled to better accommodate the uh, student population we have there and the parking lot was repaved at Prairie Ridge. And these are all projects that were completed this past summer. And with that, I'll turn it over to Daryl. Thank you. Um, as you can see from uh, the, the chart that's up here, and Kim alluded to all the little check marks, uh, the last three years have been uh, pretty robust and energetic that what we undertook. There were 76 projects that have been completed over the last three years to uh, help bring our buildings up to uh, the code and the security and safety things that we need and to make some necessary repairs that happen. Uh, unfortunately, there was one down there by that little red arrow that fell a little short. Uh, we had uh, our vendor contractor that was uh, working with all of our window projects we just without staffing he that we were just unable to complete that one this year but uh, we are looking to move forward for that one to complete that one uh, next summer uh, to complete the full full line of projects um, again the remaining dollars that were left over again will go uh, we have uh, have figured in two uh, have, that has been figured into the referendum was the cost for the window replacement out at Sam Davy uh, there is also, um, we're looking into options to utilize the interest that was gained from the, the money that we uh, were using towards the referendum and what we can do to uh, maybe further some more of the, 
the necessary needs that we have on some buildings and those projects will continue to be looked at and explored for for uh, completion hopefully next summer again uh, there have been a couple of ribbon ca uh, cutting ceremonies that have been held already one at Montessori and one at Memorial uh, there are more to be planned uh, they just haven't been finalized on dates and uh, anything like that yet so uh, be watching for those and please come on out and, uh, and join everyone and and uh, celebrate their success in in the completion of their referendum projects and with that I would entertain any questions if anybody on the board has any that they would like us to answer for them if we can thank you very much for the update um, that's a lot of work and takes a lot of planning so we appreciate your patience and your leadership in this respect we, we appreciate it thank you any questions from the board yes uh, uh, mr. harder yeah thank you so much for your team and the, the whole downtown team here on the buildings and grounds working through this it's a major m milestone to get this closure on on these projects as we look ahead to a potential next referendum closure on the past one is is really vital and I know it's taken a lot of work I mean we can see <laughs> how much uh, effort w must have been required to get this done at this pace so thank you any questions or clarifications from the audience Hearing none, we'll thank you for the report. Thank you. Our next point in the agenda is OPEB discussion. Good evening, everyone. So um, we were asked to present uh, tonight on OPEB and remind the board and the public where we were and where we've been. And so um, the first slide I wanted to start off with is why does the OPEB conversation continue? Um, there's many reasons why it's continuing. And so to refresh your memory, uh, there's a significant budget impact. Um, it has been, um, there's a concern it will impact our bond rating as we go to issue debt in the future and the lack, to, lack of predictability and lack of sustainability. So when you look at the amount of our budget that is set aside for OPEB from 2014-15 until 2019-20, it's high, hovering right around that $6 million amount of our budget. And out of $150 million, it doesn't seem like it's a lot, but it really does have an impact, a huge impact on our operating budget. And that's why it continues to be a conversation for us in the Eau Claire School District. Um, just a reminder to the board that there were changes made to this liability in 2008, 2010, or 2012, depending upon which employee group you were part of. Um, and even with those changes, there's still a large impact. A little bit of historical perspective. When these benefits were bargained, benefits were many times increased in lieu of salary increases. And health insurance was much less expensive when the benefits were bargained. So just a sample, we did a little bit of digging and we looked at the family plan cost in the year 2000, 2001. You can see the total premium was $621. Very different from this year's family plan of 1928-05 and that's per month. Um, in the two years that have stars, there were multiple plans offered by the district in those years. And so we just chose to compare it to the least expensive premium that was offered by the district at that time. You might actually look at 2012-13 and 2019-20. You can see the premium in 12-13 was 1966-44 and in 19-20, it's 1928-05. I'm sure you will remember that we increased deductibles, increased um, co-pays and things to maintain a less of an impact um, in the 1920 related to health insurance. And so that's why those years are different. And over the course of many years, not just those two years in particular, um, we've been looking at and evaluating our health insurance plans and do we make plan design changes or do we go with the um, increases that are presented to us at the time we're looking at that. Another thing that I thought it was important to share with the board was just the dollar value um, related to the employees that are um, 
that have each plan. So in 2018-19, we spent about $5.8 million for our OPEB plan. We have about 571 active employees that still qualify for that plan at, at an average cost of just over $10,000 per person. When we compare that to the defined contribution, which is what's in place after 2008, 10, or 12 based upon employee group, the cost for that was about $1.8 million, and there are 720 employees that qualified for that on an average cost of about $2,500. So there is a big difference to the employees and to the district as well when we're looking at that big picture. So when we add those together, our OPEB cost and our defined contribution, that's about $7.3 million of our budget each year. So reminding you what was voted on at the August board meeting, the board approved to um, five options. There were nine that were presented. The five that were approved by the board were shifting the HRA contribution date, um, earning the HRA like a married couple would earn it instead of an automatic contribution. There will no longer be an HRA contribution for retirees after retirement. Um, locking in the insurance rate at the year of retirement instead of the year after and then modification of a cap based upon the individual's need. And if you'll remember right, that is uh, looking at um, giving them the plan that they need. So currently, if I retire with a family plan, I'm gonna get that family plan and the premium deposits for that time until I reach Medicare eligibility. The, um, the recommendation from the committee was to look at how long do they need a family plan and do they have dependents um, dropping off or somebody reaching Medicaid eligibility earlier and then drop to a limited family or from a limited family to a single plan. Um, the thing that I learned in talking to the actuary is that those assumptions are already built into the actuary study that's provided with us. So there isn't going to be an impact related to that as far as the overall liability. We would see the difference in the cash flow because for cash flow purposes, we're still paying that same plan. We're not modifying that. And so I wanted to provide that update as well for the board because that was something that we learned after those decisions were made. So there were four items that were tabled um, and to be discussed further. And so those four items were locking the insurance rate increase at a 3% increase, locking the insurance rate increase at a 5% increase, grandfathering based upon meeting the eligibility instead of a fixed date, and then grandfathering based upon years of service instead of needing to meet both the age and the years of service. So let's review those individually one by one and we can have discussion as we're going through. The first one I put onto one slide because uh, the board would need to choose if they wanted to have a 3% increase maximum over 30 years or a 5% maximum increase. And basically what that's doing is saying let's lock in the, in, the um, premiums and then either a 3% increase is allowed each year or a 5%. So if that premium was $1,000 today, then next year the most it could increase is 3 or 5%. And then the retiree would bear the cost if health insurance went up more than 3 or 5%. Um, a reminder that if the board chose to go with a 3% maximum increase, it saves about $2 million over 30 years. If the board chose to go with a 5% maximum increase, it would save 425000 over 30 years. Um, and so I just wanted to remind the board that that was one of the things that the Budget Development Committee looked at early on when they were reviewing OPEB and when we started this conversation in 2016 or 2017. Um, and because it didn't meet the goals of the cost savings, um, at that point in time, budget development chose not to bring that forward to the full school board. And so it's back here because that was what the committee had recommended that they wanted to bring forward. The next item that uh, was still under consideration was um, talked about employees meeting the age and years of service requirements. So the dates that I have up here were June 30, 2021 or June 30, 2023. Those are from the original April 2018 presentation to the school board when we started bringing forward that OPEB to the board again. And so they were just examples. It's nothing in stone. Just wanted to put that out there that we used that data from the original um, presentation that was provided in April. So if you'll remember back, the scenarios presented assumed that you met the retire or met the qualifications for retirement on either by June 30, 2021 or June 30, 2023. And then you would need to retire by those dates as well. 
Um, and so there was a lot of conversation about that's forcing people out. What if I want to continue to work? Um, we're not really sure that we like that. And so this recommendation from the committee was if I meet the criteria to retire, meaning age and years of service by those dates, whatever they would be, then let me continue to work, but I still receive the original OPEP benefits and don't change my benefits. Um, and so in this one, the committee recommended that they still need to meet both of the criteria that are currently in place to receive the OPEP benefit. The last one is a little bit different, and the difference in that one is um, still allowing grandfathering to receive the same current OPEP benefits, but letting me just meet the years of service requirement instead of the age and years of service requirement by those specific dates. And so the committee talked a lot about the number of employees that have devoted their careers to the Eau Claire School District, and maybe they're 49 years old and have met the years of service requirement, but they don't have the age. And if there's a three or a five year grandfather, they would fall just outside of those buckets. And so the committee said, um, bring it forward that um, we just have to meet that years of service requirement instead of years of service and age. So the timeline, um, we talked about this at budget development a little bit the last time that we met um, and wanted to just refresh the board kind of where, we, where we're at and where do we think we might be going. Um, so in the month of September, we submitted um, updated actuary information, census data to the actuary, and so the actuary is in the uh, process of providing us a new actuary study. Um, that is going to take us into probably mid-November before we get those back. And so um, we've been talking with them and they've had some questions based upon decisions that have already been made, so I know they're looking at it. Um, but we will anticipate a full report, um, not until probably mid-November. And then you can see there's a question mark by discussing the results with budget development and determining next steps. Again, that's going to be decided um, by the committee chair as to once we get the results, when do we bring that to budget development? And then the next question mark is when do we bring it back to the full school board? Um, and then there's a question mark as well by the school board um, making a decision to any, if there's going to be any more changes or not based upon the items that were um, postponed from that original August meeting. And the other thing that I always like to remind the board is that February 1st of 2020 is an important date for our certified staff because that's when they need to notify um, the school district that they plan to retire that year. And so um, we try to stress that if there is going to be a decision that it's early enough so that way then people have some time to think about if they want to make a different decision if they want to retire. And so we just remind the board of that because that's a very important date for all of our um, certified staff that have worked here for a long time. Um, so with that, um, I am happy to answer any questions and allow some time for board discussion and some direction for our next steps. Thank you, Abby, for the update. <clears throat> any questions from the board members to uh, Abby Johnson? When is the actuarial report going to be? You said November? Yeah, we're expecting it mid to late November. Mid to late November. Yep. Because we are scheduling a work session, a board work session. Late November. Late November. Mm -hmm. So it's about the time when we'll have to uh, focus on that discussion, right? Could, yeah, I can get the exact date from the actuary and I could provide that to Dr. Hardebeck. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Harder? Yeah, I can say just from the chair of the budget committee perspective, um, uh, OPEB is, uh, I consider it one item of consideration on our, the, the, the sort of work list that we considered. It's been over the last couple of years, a primary focus of consideration for the reasons uh, Ms. Johnson pointed out. Uh, there, there are a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a compelling target. You look at the numbers, it's, it's a large number, and we can use every dollar we can get here in the district right now. So um, that's why I can, it, the other reason it continues to come up as a topic is because we can't really as a board say, no, we're done with this forever. There's just no way to do that. 
Um, what I think we probably can do is say for some period of constrained time, maybe a one year time frame, for example, probably not much longer than that, but we can say here's what we intend to do over this year uh, in terms of action or non-action. And uh, I think it's important to communicate that to staff. There's a lot of uncertainty, understandably, around this, and there has been for quite a while. Uh, that's been my objective, is to try to, uh, well, frankly, uh, my hope has been to somewhat put a pin in OPEB. We've kind of, we've reached a, a bit of a point. We, we kind of know different positions and opinions on it. Okay, can we put that on hold? We also know that the savings don't really start for, for a few years out. Um, uh, we have some pressing needs, some pressing immediate needs in terms of balancing our budget that uh, OPEB doesn't directly and immediately address. Uh, so it's a question of pulling together that full list of ideas. That's that's the way I've been approaching it from budget is can we get that comprehensive list, consider and prioritize the ideas we think most promising. Obviously OPEB is on that list, but what else is on that list? Let's look at the whole, sort of holistically look at the picture and hopefully be able to, uh, in that process, communicate something definitive to staff about what we intend to do with OPEB in that, this coming year time frame. So. Thank you. Hopefully we can uh, have that uh, communication ready soon. Any questions for, any other questions for Abby from the audience? Hearing none, uh, thank you, Abby, for the report. And we'll move on to the next uh, point of the agenda, which is discussion and possible first reading of revisions to policy 453.12, concussion and brain injury management. Uh, it is very short. Uh, the text that you see in green is the addition. Uh, and there is a, a conjunction uh, uh, deleted. So shall we just read the paragraph that is a uh, matter of the modification? Yes, anybody would like to volunteer reading? Uh, Dr. Nordin, thank you. Support services for students with concussions shall be coordinated by a team that may include the student, family, school staff, the student's medical provider, and the school's athletic trainer if the student is an athlete. Parents who inform coaches and teachers that their child is being treated by a healthcare professional for a concussion must provide written clearance from the healthcare professional for full or limited participation in class, practice, activity, or competition. Prior to receiving written clearance from a healthcare professional, students who have sustained a concussion may have limited participation in school-related physical activities. Thank you very much. So that's the first reading. Uh, does the board have any questions? Hearing none, then we'll move this to our consent agenda for our next uh, session and we'll approve it together with other items. The next point in the agenda is request for future agenda items. The agenda setting committee meets tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Hearing none, uh, we'll just go with the list that we already have. And that's uh, all the items for the agenda tonight. It is uh, 8.22. I'll entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. So moved. Uh, moved by Dr. Nordin and a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Harder. Uh, those who approve say aye. aye. Those who don't say aye. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the Eau Claire Area School Board. NewsWorks is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 